According to Mark chapter 9, as Aaron read earlier, there are two times that disciples really don't want to talk. One is when they don't understand what Jesus is talking about. The other is when they don't want Jesus to understand what they are talking about. They are still struggling to accept any kind of idea that he might face betrayal and death. And you can't get to the point of understanding the resurrection if you can't understand the dying first part. It's a sign of how deaf they are to Jesus' efforts to show them a different understanding of the word Messiah. That they still are worrying and, and really even arguing among themselves about their ranking when Jesus comes to power. And if leadership leads not to power, but rather to servanthood and to suffering, then what does it look like to follow that kind of a leader? They can't understand what that kind of followership looks like when they are fighting about who gets to be above the other. To this, Jesus says, greatness will be found in how far one is willing to go in giving love. Now, when he takes the child in his arms and says, you find greatness by welcoming such a one, his actions are going even further than we might think. In the Greek language this was written in, it was not the normal word for child used in describing what Jesus is doing. It's kind of an unusual word because it is a word that comes not from the word for child, but it comes from the word for servant. So in the first century, first of all, children were not seen in the idealized way that we tend to see children. Children were basically seen as being the father of the household's property. And, and then below the children were the servants. But this is a term that goes lower than that because basically the word used here that we translate as child means child servant. So if the servants were low and below even the children who were seen as property in the household pecking order, the child servants were the lowest of the low among the low. It, it was, a, this is really what Jesus is modeling and what he's saying is about being kind to the one who has absolutely no chance of giving anything to you in return. No hope of ever paying you back in any kind of a way. Jesus says, you welcome him and you welcome his father when you give welcome to the one who has no way of giving you anything in return. No hope of raising your worldly status, which is what they were so concerned about. So they are looking upward and thinking about position. He wants them to look down and think about kindness because he says that is where they will truly find God. Now, I want to look at James, though, and talk about something that's really not that different as far as ideas go. It's James chapter 3 and going into chapter 4 and a few verses skipping ahead, but <clears throat> it's going to be on the screen if you want to follow along. The words of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have 
because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It seems as the church went forward, the problems modeled by Jesus' disciples continue to be problems in the years that came. James is concerned with wisdom and understanding. In other words, knowledge isn't enough. We live in the information age where so much information is immediately available to us. But knowledge, information is not enough. Ability, talent is not enough. We need to understand what the right thing to do is and why we should do it. And it's what James would call in his writing the good life. And it's when your actions show what the NRSV that I was reading from translates as gentleness born of wisdom. Now some translations will use the word meekness here but sometimes we hear the word meek and we don't really understand it. We tend to hear the word meek and think somehow that that means weak. Meekness is not about being weak. It is about having strength that is used with restraint. Strength that is used in a gentle way. Jesus becomes the ultimate expression of that as the one whom Paul writes in Philippians empties himself of equality with God and endures suffering and death. Jesus chooses not to hang on to power and on the cross he chose not to use power. Meekness is having strength, but always being guided in the use of that strength by love and compassion. And, and this doesn't come easily for everyone. Honestly, maybe it doesn't come easy for anyone. Verse 14 says we need to face up to our struggles with these issues. And our struggles, according to James here, are with bitter envy and selfish ambition. Now, in, in the original language, envy comes from a word that strangely enough means, means something like hot or like heat. It's like saying that we are hot for some things that we want and we do not have. And selfish ambition is kind of an unusual Greek word. It means to be like conniving and willing to bring strife or conflict to somehow help you to get ahead, to get what you want, or even to feel better about yourself. So it may just be a heart, kind of a feeling thing, but if we're honest, do we sometimes, do we resent people who have things that we do not? Do we resent people who achieve things that we don't? Do we even maybe sometimes resent people who are recognized for things that they have done that we honestly, it's not that we couldn't do them, we just didn't do them. Or maybe even, do we look at the successes of other people and, and feel bad somehow as if it makes us feel less of good about ourselves? James tells us to face up to our inner struggles, not to try to deny them or hide them away. Hidden away, they fester, mess us up, they lead to conflict. They wreck our relationships. And, and I think it is hard in our culture to wrestle with some of this stuff. We live in competition. We are evaluated. We are tested constantly. We are measured to see if we should be able to go to school where we, we might want to go to school or to study what we want to study or to do what we want to do. And it's hard to celebrate the accomplishments of others when we are always worrying about how well we are doing ourselves. And, and then some people, some people like to flaunt what they have that we don't. And, and we wish we didn't care, but sometimes we do. I, I remember something that happened many years ago and, and I think it's enough years back that I can talk about it because the people that are involved were not here. Um, there was a parent who brought her child, her son, to Sunday school. And brought her son to the children's Sunday school class with a really big box of donuts. Not to share. But he sat in that room with other children beside him and across from him 
And he proceeded to very slowly and deliberately eat them in front of the other kids in the class. And then finally, there was a moment where the hyperactive boy in the class sitting directly across from him could take it no more. And he did a flying tackle across that table and took out that kid with his box of donuts. <sighs> Have you ever felt a little torn about whose side to take in a conflict? The taunter or the tackler? And if you've ever been on the outside looking in, don't you kind of get that little boy's position just a little bit? I think that was the week, looking back, that we decided that if you brought your kid to Sunday school with some big bag of carry out or something to eat and not share, you ate alone in the hall. <laughs> um, you didn't get to eat it in front of everyone in the classroom. And I think, had it been about 18 years now, <laughs> we're still sticking to that policy. But one of those kids is my hero. I'm not going to talk about which one. And, and maybe we all have felt those emotions. And this is why we don't just need to want to see our lives and the lives of those around us in a godly way. We need help if we're going to get there. When James talks about wisdom from above, he's talking about a God-given perspective about what's really important, of what will really make our lives better, and the ability to know a true contentment despite what we may not have, what we may not ever have. To paraphrase James, we want to live life in a way that is clean, that takes no joy in giving hurt, that desires peace, that has compassion, that doesn't need to win and treats everyone the right way without having to fake the kindness. James is a guy who all through his epistle writes from the perspective of ordinary life. He expects us to live and to study and to work just to do the things people do. He wants us though to do them really well and to do them just living out our best, our most positive life. And, and we can struggle inside. And he believes we all wrestle some, at some point in our lives with desire. We want stuff. We resent stuff. And it can move us in bad directions. And it can bring conflict into our lives. And, and we usually don't get the help we need because either we don't talk to God about it or when we do go to God, we're asking for the wrong things. For James, this is not intended to lead us in a negative direction perspective on ourselves. James is hoping to move us toward honesty about the things we struggle with, the things that make us doubt ourselves, and, and the things that make us wrestle with unhappiness. And the honesty is what he hopes will encourage us to go to God for the right things. And, and it's amazing in the last part of this reading how simple his answers to all of this really are. He says simply, first, submit to God. Be willing to entrust your life, your future, where, where it's all going to go for you, to him. Believe that God is good, that he cares, he desires to help you live your best life. And, and there is an assurance given here. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It, it, what a short, victorious statement. The evil in our lives is not stronger than the help we find in God. We can fight against this and we can win. We can find our peace and contentment. And, and there's a promise that it ends with. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God is approachable. God is ready. And if you want more of him, you will get more of him. That is the first Bible verse I remember learning when my first grade teacher had her little plastic loaf of bread with little Bible verses and we each got one. Mine was draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Strangely, 53 years later, it's still in my head. God wants to give more of himself to us. He just wants us 
to want more of him in our hearts, in our lives. And it really is about desire, I guess. It's about whether the greatest desires of our lives are for more of God. If that's our desire, it's going to lead to more peace, more contentment, and ultimately the chance for real happiness. We won't find those things by chasing what other people have that we do not. We will find them when our hearts find freedom in Christ. Freedom to love what is good and freedom to do what is kind. Can we pray together? God, we all struggle. So often, it may be life, it may be some things in family or friendships, Sometimes we're taught to feel bad about ourselves. And when we feel bad about ourselves, we compare ourselves to others in a negative way. Would you work to free us from this? Help us to ask for the right things. And, and what we need to ask for is, is freedom from the, the things the world will teach us to pull us down. And then we need more of you to bring the peace, to bring the contentment, to bring the joy of life in the world you've created and given to us. Help us to live from that place of peace and joy and contentment and not from negativity and beating ourselves up and making ourselves feel inferior. Protect us, heal us, and help us. We want to live good lives filled with your goodness and overflowing with that goodness into the lives of the people around us. God, help us to heal, to learn, to mature, Teach us to be wise in the way we see our lives and the lives of the people around us. We will seek you. Answer our prayer for more of you. We pray in Jesus' name, all these things. Amen. I want to end with a couple of verses from Psalm chapter 1 and make it our blessing for this week. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. To make that our blessing for this week, may you find peace through discovering directions for each day that flow from your relationship with the Lord. May you learn that God's word is always at work to shape your heart toward its best and most joyful existence. And finally, may you always be able to see and to say that God has abundantly blessed every step of your life's journey. Thank you. You're dismissed.